Hello, good day everyone. My name is Jeremiah for EDUC211 Facilitating Learning for our lesson for review of the theories related to learner's development. So for our learning objectives. So at the end of discussion, uh, you are uh, expected to explain the salient concepts and principles of the major developmental theories, demonstrate appreciation of how these theories provide a framework for understanding learners, apply these theories to teaching learning, teaching learning situations, and understand the different possible scenarios of the learners that relates to their ability. So Albert Einstein once mentioned, and I quote, in theory, theory and practice are the same, in practice they are not. So basically Albert Einstein is pointing out that theory without practice is useless and is technically that theory can amend or help the practice of something to be more relevant and efficient. So theories related to learner's development. So theories are vital because they give meaning, they give guide to what we see. So it also helps the researcher investigate and collects that and collects information through observation. So uh, for teachers and facilitators, uh, 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 theories is very important uh because in a particular way to teach it it has a consequences related to how people learn as facilitators of learning so our goal as teacher is to make sure that learning is relevant and is aligned to the needs of the learner so we want to also uh, apply the right instructional strategies that help the learners or the students to achieve their goals and once, became, once they become aware or know this learning theory, so, and when the students are knowledgeable about these theories, we can begin to understand the process of uh, learning and understand our beliefs about the learning and challenge our uh, existing assumptions ab around the methods and methodologies of learning. So theories related to learners' development, so we have uh, actually six so one is from the famous Sigmund Freud which we will be discussing the component of personality and five psychosexual theories we also have Eric Erikson psychosocial social theory we also have Jean Piaget uh, cognitive theory we also have Leigh Vygotsky's social cultural theory we also have Lawrence Colbert's moral development moral development theory and we also have Yuri Bro Brown Brenner's bioecological theory. So Sigmund Freud's five components of personality. So according to Sigmund Freud, human personality is complex and has more than uh, one component. In his famous psychoanalytic theory, Freud states that personality is composed of three elements known as the e ego and superego. So these elements work together to create complex human behavior. So it is the primitive and instinctive component of a personality that operates according to the pleasure principle. While on the other hand, ego is the decision-making component of that personality that operates according to reality and principle. So, and the last is the moral component, which is the so super ego the moral component of personality that incorporates social standards about what represents right and wrong. The superego tries to perfect and civilize our behavior. It works to suppress all unacceptable urges of the id and struggle to make ego act upon idealistic standards rather than upon realistic principles. The superego is present in the conscious, preconscious, and unconscious of a person. So when talking about the id, the ego, and the superego, it is important to remember that these are not three separate entities with clearly defined boundaries. These aspects are dynamic and always interrupting to influence an individual's overall personality and behavior. A person who has good ego uh, strength can effectively manage these pressures, while a person with too much or too little ego uh, strength can be unyielding or disruptive. So what happens if there is an um, imbalance in these components. So according to Freud, uh, the key healthy personality is a balance between the id and the ego and the superego. If the ego is able to adequately 
moderate between the demands of reality, the hidden super ego are healthy and well, uh, are healthy and well, and it can adjust a healthy and well personality uh, that emerges. So Freud believed that the imbalance between these elements would lead to a mild adaptive personality. So this is the example of uh, the id ego and super ego. So for example, uh, when you are doing a task, so your id tells you to uh, do it now. So your thinking part, which is ego, will say maybe we can compromise or think of another way. And super ego will tell us what is right or it is not right to do that. So. For example, uh, in uh, in a more uh, simple manner, when you when you want to sleep and you have a, when you have a lot of assignments and you are tired and you want to sleep, your id will tell you to sleep right now because you're tired, and your ego can tell you that maybe you can sleep for ten minutes and wake up again, but super ego will tell you that. You should finish your task before sleeping. So this is Freud's psycho. Uh, this is Freud psychoanalytic part of also part of uh, Freud psychoanalytic theory, wherein personality is divided into two into three structures. So let us go to Sigmund Freud's stages of psychosexual development. So Freud theorized that people evolved to the series of psychosexual stages that we have summarized here. Uh, the manner in which certain key tasks and experiences are handled during each stage is thought to leave a lasting imprint of one's adult personality. So Freud theorized that people evolved through the series of psychosexual stages that we have summarized here. The manner in which the key tasks and experiences are handled during each stages is thought to leave a lasting uh, also. So this uh, refers to the five stages. So the first one is the oral stage. Uh, the age range is from zero to one year old. So what happens at this is the children are derived uh, pleasure from oral activities, including sucking and tasting. They like to put things in their mouths. And the next one is the uh, uh, anal stage. This is from two or uh, to three years old children. So uh, they begin the body training at this age. Uh, and the third stage is phallic stage, which is from three to six years old. Uh, boys are more attached to their mothers, while girls are more attached to their fathers. So latency stage happens at six years old to puberty, so wherein children spend more time and interact with mostly with the same sex peers. And lastly, genital stage, this stage beyond puberty, wherein individuals are attracted to the opposite sex uh, or gender peers. So uh, one of the importance of Sigmund Freud's psychosexual theory is the emphasis on early experiences in the development of personality and as an influence to the latter behavior. The relationship uh, the children cultivate their views about themselves and others uh, and their uh, level of adjustment and well-being as adults are influenced uh, by the quality of experience that they have in its psychosexual stage without doubt. Freud's theory of psychosexual development is one of the most complex and controversial theory of child development. Although his theory has been the subject of much criticism, we cannot discount the important ideas that Freud has contributed to the field of psychology and human development. So this is a illustration of Freud's psychosexual stages. So the oral stage, the anal stage, the phallic stage, uh, the latent stage and the genital stage. So like what is mentioned a while ago, so from the oral, they put things and, and taste things using their mouth. In the anal, they begun their potty training. In the phallic, uh, this is also this uh, uh, the time wherein 
sometimes uh, the boys and girls have their uh, started the attachment to other persons, the latency stage or so-called puberty and the genital stage. So this is another uh, another example. So we, we now go to Eric Erickson's uh, psychosocial theory. So uh, Eric Erickson believed the, in the impact of the significant other uh, in development of one's, uh, of one's uh, idea or personality himself, uh, life, so as his or her life and the other world, so he presented to us eight stages of psychosocial development. So the first one is trust versus mistrust. This occurs from zero to 18 months or infancy. So what happens in this is the uh, in this stage is that the children develop a sense of trust when caregivers provide reliability, care, and affection. The next stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. This happens at the early childhood to uh, most commonly to two to two years old to three years old, wherein uh, children need to develop a sense of personal control over physical skills and a sense of independence. Uh, success leads to the feeling of autonomy. Uh, you feel your results in, uh, uh, you can feel the autonomy when something is successful and you feel shame and doubt when you fail so initiative versus guilt so this in, um particularly in the preschool period usually from three to five years old of the children so this the children needs to begin a certain control of power over the environment uh success in this state leads to a sense of purpose children who try to exert too much power, uh, experience is approval, Resert, resulting in a sense of guilt. The next stage is industry versus inferiority. So this happens during school age from six to 11 years old. So children need to cope up with the new social and academic demands. Uh, success to this uh, stage leads to the sense of competence while fa failure in this uh, state results in a feeling of inferiority. So identity versus role. So uh, this happens uh, from 12 to 18 years old, wherein teens need to develop a sense of self uh, and personal personal identity. So success leads to an ability to stay true to yourself, where failure leads to confusion or to road confusion and a weak sense of self. So the next stage is intimacy versus isolation. So this occurs at a young adults age, particularly 19 to 40 years old. So young adults need to form intimate loving relationship with other people. The success on this stage leads to a strong, uh, leads to be a strong, leads to a strong personality. So a strong relationship while failure results in loneliness and isolation. So the next stage is generativity versus stagnation. So this happens in the middle child adulthood from 42 to 65 years old. So adults need to create or nurture things that will outlast them often by having children or creating positive change that benefits other people. Uh, the success on this stage leads to the develop, uh, leads to the feeling of usefulness and accomplishment while failure results in a shallow involvement in the world or being stagnant. So we also have integrity versus despair. This occurs during the older and adult stage from 65 to death. So older adults need to look back on life and feel the sense of fulfillment and achievement. So success at this stage leads to a feeling of wisdom, while failure resorts to in regret, bitterness, and despair. So this is a illustra an illustration for the stages of psychosocial development. So in the in the social psychosocial task or crisis, the virtue developed in trust versus mistrust is hope. The virtue developed in autonomy versus shame in doubt is will. The uh, virtue developed in initiative versus guilt is purpose. The uh, virtue developed in industry versus inferiority is competency. 
the virtue developed in identity versus confusion is fidelity. Uh, the virtue developed in intimacy versus isolation is love. Uh, the virtue developed in generativity versus stagnation is care. And lastly, the virtue developed in integrity versus despair is wisdom. So we have the Swiss John Piaget for cognitive theory. So the theory of cognitive theory suggests that children move to four different stages of mental development. So history focuses not only on understanding how children acquire knowledge, but also on understanding the nature of intelligence, uh, uh, which includes the stages of sensory motor or the operational stage, the concrete operational stage, and the formal operational stage. So let us expand each stage. So the sensory motor stage, it happens from uh, birth to two years from birth, so to two years, two years old or two years of age. So children explore the world using their senses and ability to move. They develop object permanence and the understanding that concepts and metal images represent objects people and events. So the next one is operational stage. This happened from the ages two to seven years old. So young children can mentally represent and refer to objects and events with words or pictures and they can pretend however they cannot conserve logical reason or simultaneously consider uh, many characteristics of an object. So the third stage is conc and the other stage is the concrete operational stage happens around seven years of age to 11 years old. Uh, children at this stage are able to conserve, reverse their thinking and classify objects in terms of their many characteristics. They can also think logically and understand analogy, but only about uh, concrete events or something that they can hold or tangible things. So for my operational stage, uh, this happens from 12 years up, uh, people at is, at this stage uh, can use abstract reasoning about hypothetical events or situations, uh, think about logical possibilities, uh, use abstract analogies, and systematically examine and test hypotheses. Although not everyone can eventually reason uh, all these ways. So this is an illustration for John Hager's stages of cognitive development. So what happens in this stage? In the sensory motor, uh, they have the coordination of senses with motor response, sensory curiosity about the world, language used for demands and cataloging. We also have object permanence uh, is being developed in the child for the pre-operational, they have uh, developed symbolic thinking, use of proper syntax and grammar to express concepts. So they also have imagination and intuition. Uh, at this stage, it is very strong, uh, they, but they have complex abstract thoughts. They have difficulties in the so-called complex abstracts and conservation is developed in this stage. The, in the concrete operational, concepts are attached to concrete situations. Time, space, and quantity are understood and can be applied, but not as an independent concepts. The formal and operational stage uh, is focused on the development of the theoretical, hypothetical, and counterfactual thinking, uh, abstract logic and reasonings that are also developed in this stage. Strategy and planning becomes possible. Concepts are learned in one context and can be applied to another. So this is a good example for the cognitive development. So at the first one, uh, the baby has learned to hold the glass. On the other, in the pre-operational stage, the child learns to identify the water. He or she knows that the thing is water. In the concrete and operational stage, the child has an idea of what, uh, what is the level of water. Uh, he can measure up the water and at the same time differentiate uh, the types of glass that will or the uh, containers wherein the water will be put. 
And then the formal operational wherein the person has an idea on uh, the dosage of water that he or she will drink. So we also have Leib Vygotsky's sociocultural theory. So Leib Vygotsky is a famous Russian psychologist that, the that developed the theory of cognitive development in children or known as the Vygotsky social, social cultural theory of cognitive development in the early uh, 20th century. Uh, the main assertion of Vygotsky is that cognitive development in early childhood is advanced through social interaction with other people, particularly those who are more skilled. So in other words, uh, Vygotsky believed that social learning comes, from, uh, comes before cognitive development in children and that children construct knowledge actively. So Vygotsky believed that children develop cognitively when someone else helps them by asking uh, leading questions and providing examples of concepts uh, in a process that he calls as or coins as scaffolding. So scaffolding refers to the temporary support given to a child by a more knowledgeable as that enables the child to perform a task until such time that the child can perform this task independently or by himself or by herself. According to Vygotsky, the of scaffolding entails changing the quality and quantity of support provided to a child in the course of teaching session. The more knowledgeable, the other adjusts the levels of guidance in order to feed the students or cope up with the current level of the performance of the student. So scaffolding strategies can use uh, first language. They can read aloud. They can use modeling and gestures. Uh, they can co create a small peer group or an intentional small group or partner work. They can sentence structures for a starter. So for example, they will put a blank notes like I know blank because blank. They can connect to the background knowledge. They can use graphic organizers so as visuals and realias. So Vygotsky also proposed that each developing child has a so-called CPD or zone of proximal development, which states what the child and learner can do by themselves or what the child or learner can do with the help of their teachers. So the blue side on the right corner of the circular illustration shows the CPD or what the child can learn through scaffolding and guidance. And the violet one on the right side is the current understanding or the uh, skills or methods that the child can do with the, that, is, that is unassisted. So as the child progresses to learn, the zone of proximal development reaches the green part, which is called the out of reach or the skills and knowledge that the child has currently out of reach. So Leigh Vygotsky's CPD also proposed that each developing child, uh, which is, uh, has the difference between, uh, or the CPD sh shows what a child can do alone and what the child can do with the help of a teacher. So, or, uh, CPD is best understood as the zone of the closest to the most immediate psycho psychological and psychosocial development of learners that includes a wide range of their emotional, cognitive, and volitional psychological processes. So we also have Lawrence Colbert's moral development theory. So Lawrence Colbert is a Harvard University professor that saw that one important aspect uh, in the uh, cognitive uh, advances uh, occurs in adolescence uh, or in the teenage year. Uh, this is this concerns that teenagers' understanding of right and wrong. Uh, Colbert proposed that, that there are three levels of moral development or the knowledge of right and wrong behavior. So Lawrence Colbert states that uh, the stages of moral development constitute 
uh, an adaption of a psycholo psychological theory originally conceived by his predecessor, the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget. Uh, so Coburg defined three levels of moral development as the following, uh, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. So each level has two distinct stages. During the pre-conventional level, uh, a child's sense of morality is externally controlled. So the pre-conventional morality in this stage, the child's behavior is governed by the consequence of the behavior. This is typically observed to a very young age where in the time where the children has the so-called innocence. Uh, uh, the child or the young children uh, has as the de uh, determine the morality or the behavior uh, is rewarded when right or he or she does the right thing and gets punished when he does the wrong one. So example, a child who steals a toy from another child and does not get, uh, does not get cause, uh, does not see the stealing in action as wrong because uh, no one's gonna tell the child that what he has done or stealing is bad. So another one is conventional morality. So the second level of moral development in which the person's behavior is governed by conforming the society's norms or norms of behaviors. The term conventional refers to a general standards or norms of behavior for a particular society which will differ from one social group or culture to another. So typically applies to older children, adolescents, so as adolescents and most adults. So conformity to social norm is right and then uh, conformity is wrong. For example, uh, child criticizes his or her parent for public smoking because public, public smoking is against the law. So in this stage, a child has basically the basic concepts of right and wrong and he himself or he or she herself has the idea of imposing this not only to themselves but to others as well and the last is the false conventional so morality in this stage uh, the person's behavior is guided by the market moral principles that have been decided on by the individual and that may be in disagreement with accepted social norm so this stage applies to about 20 percent of the adult population moral principle is determined by a person and is used and are used to determine right and wrong and may disagree with societal uh, norms. For example, a reporter who wrote a story controversial, uh, who wrote a story, uh, controversial story or a phenomenal story goes to jail rather than reveal the source's identity. So in this one, the person has the concept of standing on his or her moral principle. So the level one, the pre-conventional, uh, the pre-conventional part of the rules to avoid punishment acts in his own interest. Uh, in this stage, the so-called innocence in the positive way and blind obedience in the negative way to authority for its own sake. So the level two, conventional. So it lives up to the expectations of others in order to fulfill the duties and obligations of the social system and uphold laws. So for example, the child a while ago, that we put the example, uh, he prohibits other person from smoking, so as his parents, because it, the law says so. So the last is the post-conventional, the principle, follows the internalized and universal principles of justice and right, balances concern for self with concern for others, and in common good or act in common good or goodwill, acts in an independent and ethical manner regardless of the expectation of others. This is a time when the person becomes principled and stand for his or her views. So we also have Yuri Braun of Fen Brenner's uh, bioecological theory. Uh, this theory looks at the child's development within the context of the system of relationship uh, that forms his or her environment. So Braun Penbrenner theory defines complex layers of environment, each having an effect on a child's development. So this theory is to emphasize that the child's own biology is a primary environment fueling his or her development, the interaction between these factors 
are in. So the child's uh, maturity, his immediate family, community, environment, and the societal landscape fuels and steers his development, changes, or conflicts in any layer will report throughout the layers to study a child's development. We must not only look at the child's and hear the emergent environment, but uh, also, or more importantly, consider the interaction of the larger environment as well. So we have the bioecological theories layer. So the first layer is called the microsystem. It is the closest to the child and contains a structure with which the child has a direct contact to the microsystem. Uh, and it encompasses the relationship and in interactions as a child has with his or her immediate surrounding structures in the microsystem. It includes family, school, peers, and work. At this level, a relationship have to impact direction in both away from the child or towards the child. So for example, so we have this example. So the microsystem. So let's go back. So the meso system. This layer provides the connection between the structure of the child, uh, the microsystem, for example, uh, the connection between the child, the teacher, the child's teacher, uh, his parents, his facilitators, his church or the religion he belongs in, and so as his immediate neighborhood or community. The third layer is the exosystem. This defines the larger societal system or, so, or social system in which the child does not function directly the structures in this layer. So the impact in the child's development is through interaction with some structures in his microsystem. So for example, the parents workplace schedules or community-based family resources uh, our examples, uh, uh, the child may not be directly involved in this or at this level. However, he or she does feel positive or negative force involved with the interaction with his own system. And the last layer is the macro system. This may be considered as the outmost layer of a child's environment. While not being a specific framework, this layer composed of the crucial values uh, customs and laws, uh, the effect of a larger principle. So he defined uh, by Yuri von Ben Brenner uh, defined macro system uh, has a cascading influence throughout the interaction of all other layers. For example, if it is the belief of the culture uh, that parents should be solely responsible for raising their children that culture is less likely to provide a resource to help parents in turn affects the structure with which the parents function uh, the parents ability or inability to care of that responsibility uh, uh, towards their children or child with, with or within the context of child's microsystem uh, is likewise affected uh, everyone so lastly all teachers must have a thorough understanding of various learning theories to understand how to support, motivate, and inspire all students to succeed by studying these theories. Uh, teachers or facilitators of learning begin to understand their process of learning and how children develop a variety of subjects and reach a particular developmental milestone. So this is the illustration. So we have the microsystem, the first layer. Then we have the second layer. So the microsystem has the child, the daycare center, the family, and the immediate, uh, the immediate community. The next one is the microsystem. Then the ec exosystem. And lastly, the macrosystem. And in his revised versions of the theory, the chrono system exists. Uh, this is the change in behavior of a particular person uh, that changes uh, through the environmental changes or over time. It is called as chrono 
chronal system. So for our conclusion, so different theories can be applied to achieve the maximum level of learning of the student. So thorough understanding of different theories is needed to understand, motivate, and educate students. So students are diverse with different backgrounds, race, belief system, needs, etc., and require special and practical attention. So theories are guides that can help prepare students in effective learning. So the philosopher and political activist Karl Marx mentions that a theory without practice is basically useless. So before we end, we end our discussion, so this is a, uh, a quotation from Mois Mazan. So a theory is meant for practical application. So a theory without practice, just like what Karl Marx said, is useless. So thank you for being part of this lesson. I'll see you again on our next discussion. So these are the references used. Thank you so much for 